Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. My name is Dan Schmidt. I am the marketing director here at Standard Imaging, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar for May 14, 2020, which is entitled Use of Mimi Phantom and HexaCheck in a Multi-Technology Platform Center. I do have two quick housekeeping items for you. Today's webinar, as you just heard, is being recorded for your future review, and you will get a link to that recording if you have registered for the webinar, so you can review it again at your leisure. And you may also enter questions at any time during the meeting. We will uh, keep all of our attendees muted, but you can enter questions in the question box that you see along in the webinar, uh, 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 along on the, on the side of the webinar uh, menu. And we'll attempt then to address as many of those as possible as we can at the end of the seminar. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Alonzo Gutierrez. He, he is an assistant uh, vice president and chief physicist at the Miami Cancer Institute. He also holds an appointment as vice chair and associate professor of the Department of Radiation Oncology at the Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine at Florida International University. Dr. Gutierrez received his doctorate degree in medical physics from the University of Wisconsin, yay, my alma mater, uh, and his master in business administration from the University of Texas, San Antonio. He has over 12 years of experience in radiation oncology with specialization in stereotactic radiotherapy delivery. Dr. Gutierrez is committed to ensuring excellence in radiation cancer care within the US as well as abroad. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Gutierrez. Uh, I would like to tell you, Dr. Gutierrez, I do believe that your display setting is, um, we're, we're actually seeing your, your note setting, not the full screen. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, um... As Dan mentioned, uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening uh, for those that are watching abroad. Uh, and, and, and thank you, Standard Imaging, for the uh, invitation to present. It's actually uh, um, um, an honor to be able to, to do this webinar, um, uh, given the work that we've sort of done with HexaCheck and, and, and Mimi. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, and, and thank you, everyone, for taking the time to listen. Uh, so the goal here was really just to kind of share a little bit of our experience, some of the work that we've done in the past with the uh, with in particular the HexaCheck uh, and really how we're using it in, in our center. Um, the goal for me today was is, is really just to try to um, uh, really talk about, uh, apologize for, there you go, uh, disclosure. Um, the goal was really to uh, try to talk about, um, trying to understand the need for 60 couch QA, which I think is still a little bit nebulous. Uh, I think everyone sees the value of it, but it's trying to understand kind of the role that it plays. Uh, really the role of me, me and HexaCheck at, at MCI and why we sort of decided to move forward with it and what our thought process was as we were kind of thinking about uh, the various devices to use. Uh, for those of you that aren't, that aren't really familiar with it, uh, the goal is just to kind of highlight some of the uh, key components that I think are kind of advantage, advantageous over uh, other uh, products in the market. Uh, and then we'll share kind of our long-term experience since we've really been using the product uh, here at MCI. I used it before my prior institution. But here at NCI, we've been using it for uh, almost three years now. Uh, we sort of initiated and used it to commission a couple features uh, of our systems here at the center. Um, and so for, for those that aren't really um, um, aware, so Miami Cancer Institute was a center that opened about three years ago. Um, and what was sort of unique is that uh, we're kind of um, a, a center that has, uh, the, I would say, the bulk majority of uh, delivery devices under one roof. Uh, and so if you look at our center in terms of uh, what we have of technologies, uh, we have uh, three true beam linear accelerators, uh, all of them with six, six soft couch tables. Uh, we have a uh, rad exact uh, tomotherapy therapy unit. Uh, we have a Meridian MR Linac um, um, system. Uh, we have uh, a CyberKnife M6 system, uh, Gamma Knife Icon uh, delivery treatment unit. And then we have three uh, IVA pencil beam uh, scanning gantries. And so um, it kind of puts us in a unique spot as we sort of start to think about how to develop a quality assurance program for all these products or all these technologies. We have to sort of think of something that could be uh, standard across uh, the majority of them. 
In addition to that, we also do a fair amount of other um, sort of the special procedures uh, to complement kind of the offerings that we have at the um, at the center. Uh, and so I, I sort of present this just to kind of to make everyone aware of kind of the challenge that we had and, and kind of why we sort of thought what we thought so to paint a little bit of the background. Um, so if we look at kind of the footprint of uh, of MCI, uh, you know everything's as I mentioned under one roof. Um, one of the key things that we had uh, was uh, you could see. Um, they have the proton therapy gantries, and we have uh, the three true beam accelerators, uh, uh, tomo therapy, cyber knife, gamma knife, and the MR Linux. So there's sort of two, I would say, almost orthogonal corridors uh, that, uh, um, that have the, the treatment units. Uh, and so when the center opened, uh, we did all the commissioning in-house. And so uh, the team here uh, has really you know, complements the team because they've really done a lot of work to initially start a commission on our Red Exact unit in August of 2016. And it took us two and a half years really to get to uh, uh, to the completion of our last gantry, which is the third uh, treatment gantry uh, that we had in September of 2018. And so as we sort of did this and kind of developed the programs, um, we initially decided that we were sort of going to move forward with uh, the Mimi and the HexaCheck. And so um, currently we have uh, a number of HexaCheck units on all our sort of sixth off uh, uh, treatment couches. And then we have for some of our platforms that have a really just 3D correction uh, we use it for those, uh, uh, we use a typical Mimi Phantom uh, for them as well. And so that kind of hopefully provides a, uh, a little bit of a background of kind of the, the facility and some of the challenges that we had uh, in going into it. And so it's sort of useful as to how we sort of make our next decisions and how we walk through them. And so as we started it, uh, you know, we really wanted to have a standardization of QA programs. And, you know, obviously one of the key ones for us was the daily QA program. Uh, and so the goal was really to try to find equipment that was uh, useful on all the platforms uh, and equipment that was really uh, kind of robust and, 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 and was, use, was, I would say, um, uh, quite uh, comprehensive in terms of the things that we wanted to do uh, with it. And so we did have some challenges. Obviously, step one is to kind of look at the guidelines that are out there. So we looked at all the quality assurance reports and, and provided them. And all of them, as you guys are aware, have, have a component of, of IGRT associated to them. And, uh, the component of that is also on a daily, monthly, and annual basis. And so uh, what we did is that we kind of assessed what we had. And so what was interesting for us is obviously we had systems that have caner play caner, sorry, KB planar imaging, uh, MV planar imaging as well, uh, comb beam CT, uh, MVCT, um, obviously MR Linac and also and also surface imaging uh, components on there as well. But we really focused on these in terms of the sort of the three key highlight ones that we needed. Um, we also noted that each kind of treatment unit had different types of treatment techniques. Some were VMAT or MRT. <clears throat> we had obviously uh, uh, a proton therapy using IMPT, IMPT techniques. Uh, and then many of the systems also delivered SBRT. And so we had sort of different uh, kind of end goals that we wanted to accomplish and, and different uh, um, um, uh, constraints that we needed to fulfill as we went through the QA program. Um, also, many of these had different hardware. And so we had Although some of these systems had, um, you know, six off couches, the six off couches weren't all the same. So each six off couch was a bit different. We also had some that had 3D couches that we needed to um, account for as we did the, the delivery of them. And so these were some of the things to kind of keep in mind. And so as we looked at the fences, we looked at kind of um, trying to uh, uh, standardize key features of what, what was important for us and being able to do uh, our daily QA program. And so one of them was obviously we just needed uh, very basic and this is just across the board it needed to be a robust geometrical phantom uh, and so something that was in essence going to be sturdy uh, and something that was going to be consistent uh, in terms of having that that capability if we were going to use this to sort of assess accuracy uh, during our, our, our quality assurance program um, it's uh, in addition to that since we were sort of testing uh, you know through tg1 142 and some of these guidelines were to be able to test the, the accuracy and reposition and detection of offsets uh, and so it had to have some way of uh, being able to identify and have very easy to remember offset positions uh, when we did our IDR TQA. Um, we also needed to, in essence, be able to correlate that uh, uh, and, and see, uh, visualize any sort of laser displacements and sort of quantify those uh, to be able to do that to make sure. And, and the goal was really not to have to take out a ruler every day, uh, but really to be able to visualize the, the, the difference uh, um, uh, on the phantom. Uh, in addition to that, it needed to really be kind of invariant to imaging modality. So we had to be able to use it with our KVMV planners, our uh, KVCBCT, our TOMO MVCT, uh, and potentially also surface imaging uh, to correlate sort of isocenter ISO coincidence between the two. Uh, and so we sort of looked at a phantom that could be able to do that. 
we also needed to make it really universal amongst couch tops. And so although we standardized the majority of our couch tops, there are some as well that needed to be indexable to, uh, to the Phantom. And for the most part, this wasn't too challenging, but it was something that uh, was a consideration for us to do. Um, and then the other key thing for us is as we were doing kind of the um, 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 sort of correlation and registration, we needed to make sure that the Phantom itself was easily visualized under, uh, uh, under these imaging modalities. Uh, and more importantly, was really robust to kind of um, uncertainties and being to detect features of the Phantom to be able to have a very fast and consistent auto registration uh, when we were looking at kind of volumetric imaging. And so we really wanted to make sure that, um, you know, it wasn't going to fluctuate due to weird features uh, within the Phantom. Um, and so we sort of found that obviously the for us, the, the, the Mimi Phantom really had a lot of these uh, features and really identified and was able to give us very consistent uh, um, um, uh, repositioning and uh, detection with that. Uh, here's just sort of an example. And part of it comes uh, from the Phantom design itself, where it has these uh, sort of cross rods within it. We'll talk a little bit more about them. But if you take a cone beam CT and a reference CT, you're able to see that uh, because of these sort of features around there and, and sort of some of the markers internal, uh, it's very easy to use uh, these changes in density to do a very uh, accurate uh, registration um, um, between the Phantom um, and the actually reference image. And, and so this is pretty much for our center automated and it's been very consistent in terms of uh, having uh, accurate uh, uh, correlation between the, uh, those two images on a, on a daily basis. Um, if you, if you aren't familiar with the sort of Mimi Phantom, it's uh, uh, in essence uh, 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 identified as Mimi because the multiple imaging modality isocentricity Phantom, and it's kind of was built with the understanding that you would use different imaging systems to uh, sort of assess the Phantom. The Phantom is a, uh, is a cube that's five and a half inches by five and a half inches by five and a half inches. It weighs about six pounds. It's a very sturdy Phantom. Uh, it's made of a, a polystyrene and it has these PVC rods that are uh, in essence bone equivalent. Uh, that you can see and they have kind of a unique design. Uh, if you were to take a, a, a KV cone beam CT and you look at, at, uh, at the uh, reference ISO center, uh, you should be able to, uh, to really see, hopefully you guys can see my, my laser pointer. Uh, you're able to see here the, uh, um, uh, the shape that it cast uh, from a KV uh, uh, CVCT. Uh, and if you look at a planar KV, this happens to be uh, a lateral, as you can see the A for anterior, P for posterior, you can see that the images coincide pretty nicely and create this sort of diamond uh, diamond effect where uh, there is actually a marker in the center, uh, which is a six and a half millimeter, um, um, six and a half millimeter uh, BB. That's sort of this composite high uh, alumina ceramic BB, which is dense enough to be able to see, to be seen both for KV as well as NV, but also not that dense where it causes substantial artifacts, uh, which really helps. And you can see that even on the KVs, uh, the images look really nice. And so in terms of the design of, of, of the Phantom, it, it provides really easy registration because of the sort of features internally to the Phantom, uh, as well as the capability of uh, detecting it on KV and MV. So I know particularly for us, we don't necessarily do uh, sort of graticules or, uh, or use graticules much, but if, 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 if you'd like, you can sort of put the shot tray in and also do a correlation with MV uh, if needed for some of the, uh, some of the older uh, uh, accelerators that has that capability as well. Um, now I mentioned a little bit about kind of the known offsets, and so if you look at the at the uh, Mimi, so this is actually the Mimi sitting in the hexacheck cradle, um, and if you look at uh, at the Mimi itself on the various faces, it has these uh, um, uh, offset positions, uh, and so it actually has uh, the known offset positions, which are uh, 10, 12, and 14 millimeters. Uh, so left to right is 12 millimeters, anterior, pure, posterior, 14 millimeters and then SUPIF a 10 millimeter. So if we sort of look at the top face, which correlates to this image, you can sort of see the head, the right, patient left, uh, and then feet. Uh, and then you can see the well delineated known offset positions. If you look at a lateral, it has, has these here. And if you look at uh, the other side as well, uh, you're able to see both uh, uh, the correlated positions that are known to this. And so uh, it makes it easy to take the phantom uh, and align uh, the lasers to that position. Uh, and because it's sort of the marking in the surface, it's really easy to identify it. Here's kind of a picture. I'm not sure if it does it justice uh, that uh, um, you can see the lasers, but the lasers have a really nice reflection off the phantom uh, and you're able to correlate uh, the various uh, lasers. And so we take the phantom and align it to the off offset position uh, to be able to do that. And so this is really a nice feature for us to be able to, uh, uh, to quickly position the phantom um, using the lasers to an off uh, off a known offset position. Now, this sort of kind of uh, um, uh, really uh, 
closes out some of the features that I think are useful for uh, for the Mimi. Um, but the Mimi itself, if you take the Phantom, is really uh, has been used for three dimensions, uh, for really for 3D corrections. Uh, and and so with that, you know, came the design of, of the headset check. And so uh, you know, the question of whether uh, you know is six stuff uh, couch QA really needed? I think that's kind of that's something that's been ongoing. Uh, and I think it's something that will uh, become more of a practice and really a requirement moving forward, uh, primarily because there's a lot of motivating factors um, that really allude to the fact that we should we should be incorporating that into um, in our daily practice. And I'll kind of walk through a couple. I'm sure there's a couple, there's more, but uh, in my eyes, I think these are kind of the top three. Uh, one of them is really the adoption of six um, uh, uh tabletops. You know, historically, uh, as you guys uh, are aware or not aware, you know, really. You know, CyberKnife and Bray Lab were really two of the key companies that uh, had Sixth off uh, at the time, uh, and then now we're seeing more and more of that inclusion in, in more manufacturers. You know, varying with Perfect Pitch, Electa with Hexapod. Uh, in the Proton world, I think the Leone robotic couch uh, uh, is becoming a bigger staple in there, and so all these couches really have the capabilities to do very accurate uh, positioning in Sixth in, in, in six off uh, capabilities, and so that's something that uh, will sort of mandate and, and, and uh, a need for QA. And as centers start to adopt it uh, and start using it, uh, I think the principle of, of being able to test and assess it are going to become critical uh, as well. Um, if we look at kind of the key indications where you start using these, I mean, many of them stem originally from uh, radio surgery days. And so uh, I think everyone um, that has practiced has realized, you know, even with mass, thermoplastic mask, uh, there is always some residual value. And here's just a nice study to illustrate this. There's a number of them. But this was published not too long ago, but it really showed that if you just uh, position a patient, even with the DeVasc, uh, you tend to see, uh, you know, rotations, pitch, yaw, and roll. Uh, and if you look at sort of the uh, uh, the magnitude of these rotations, uh, they tend to be roughly uh, within plus or minus two and a half degrees, uh, more commonly three, which is why, as you look to many of the manufacturers, uh, typically they have uh, tolerance uh, or capabilities of correction and six off up to three degrees, somewhere between two and a half and three degrees. And a lot of that just sort of stems from the, from, from the data, because typically if you see bigger rotations than this, generally it has to do something associated with the setup and the patients will be get, will get re, uh, reset up. Um, and so with that, you know, many of the sort of the assessments and kind of the larger extremes of, of displacements are, are associated with roughly two and a half to, uh, to three degrees in, in, in both, uh, in all three directions, both in all three pitch, roll and yaw directions. And so, uh, something to sort of keep in mind as to why many of the manufacturers kind of have these tolerances. And for those that have six soft couches, uh, many of them are aware that if you have a two and a half degree, even a three, to a three degree roll or pitch, uh, it actually makes a substantial deflection on the table. Uh, so it's not necessarily trivial um, uh, to have a sort of a two degree, uh, uh, two degree pitch. Um, and, you know, the impact of this is, is critical. Um, when we've seen a number of publications, I'm highlighting a few here. That have really shown that you know even with uh, sort of six degrees of, of, of correction, you still sort of get residual errors, uh, and some of these residual errors in, in couch position could be up to a magnitude of one degree, uh, and so that's actually uh, not too uncommon to have these. Uh, and there's more and more kind of literature being published, primarily because I think there's an increasing growth and adoption of of doing you know single isocenter multi uh, multi-target uh, uh, deliveries, where um, you know I think more of the publications are showing that. Um, um, that having a, having a single ISO center with multi-targets could potentially uh, impact uh, dosimetric coverage if uh, you have these rotational offsets. So this was a nice publication that was done uh, in 2019, which really showed that rotational setup errors for multiple brain meds cases uh, cause a non-negligible non uh, underdosing uh, for PTV and significant increases of, of the V10 and V16 uh, in SRS with hyperarc. So um, not to say that uh, um, um, that single isocenter uh, kind of single lesion deliveries uh, tend to be a bit more robust, but when you start using multiple targets, multiple, uh, uh, especially uh, away from the isocenter, you tend to see some of these non-negligible underdosing of PTV coverage. So uh, in order to get very accurate positioning, we have to assess the sort of the mechanical integrity and accuracy uh, of couches. Uh, so some of the key things to kind of keep in mind as we go. Uh, and I think, you know, I allude to kind of TG142. I think at the time when the report was done, um, uh, I know it was known that, you know, six soft couches were sort of becoming more and more common, although it was sort of, it was really not the standard of care for many centers to have. Uh, I would argue it's mostly been the ones that were doing sort of radiosurgery, uh, but we're seeing that being more common now, I think, for the use of, you know, head and neck 
and potentially some spine SBRT, uh, you're, you're seeing that more of these are being used uh, extracranially to delivery. And so if you kind of look at just, um, you know, the positioning, reposition accuracy uh, that they talked about, they initially highlighted really kind of two to one millimeter, uh, two millimeters for non-SRS SBRT and one millimeter for uh, SBRT, whether you use plantar KV or MV imaging or you're using comb beam CT. So these are some of the things that kind of keep in mind. Uh, you know, I, I would argue that, you know, I think uh, the uh, sort of various uh, rotation elements also need to be added, whether it's a 0.5 or a one, mil or one degree tolerance, I'll kind of uh, let the data sort of speak for itself, but I think it's something that we, we, we sort of adopt. And my rationale for it is, you know, if we kind of look at uh, the principles for it, I, I think in general, what TG142 was trying to accomplish in principle is to say that we have to make sure on a daily basis that as, as we're applying shifts, uh, for those that we're going to correct, that we got to make sure that the couch is uh, mechanically sound to be able to apply the shift and verify it. And so if you sort of adopt that, that you're only correcting in 3D, I think only 3D QA is allowed. But if you start using six soft couches for uh, all these other uses, I, I do think on a daily basis we should be doing six off to kind of keep with, you know, the theoretical principle that TG142's recommendations were based off of. Um, I also sort of uh, argue that if, if, you're, if you're using the system for uh, for really for um, stereotactic deliveries, uh, primarily those that are cranial radio surgeries, I would even argue some uh, extracranial spine uh, that deliver really uh, require high accuracy and positioning. Uh, I think really understanding the limitations of the sixth off couch uh, is also important to quantify that. Um, and then lastly, uh, I think uh, understanding the sort of the reproducibility and accuracy is important, primarily because um, I, I know in general the practice uh, for many of these centers are to sort of uh, acquire comb CT. Um, uh, apply the translations and then treat the patients. Uh, many, uh, I would say, I don't know, too many centers that will then go ahead and recall BMC to verify the setup. Uh, I know there's instances of radio surgery that, that gets done, but for head and neck and some of these other treatments, it's not necessarily common practice. And so, um, you know, if we're entrusting that the couch is moving to a known position because we've verified uh, the translation that, that morning during our daily QA, uh, we really should be trusting all six six degrees of freedom if that's really or sorry assessing all six degrees of freedom um, if that's really where we're going to so these are just sort of my opinions as to why i think uh, uh, it's valuable to have uh, six off and so with these sort of things in mind uh, I, uh you know we sort of looked at the hexa check uh, and so the hexa check in general is, is really just an isocentric cradle uh, and so if you think about just sort of uh, uh, kind of pitching or tilting the phantom unknown a known distance. Uh, in doing so, you're not only introducing a rotation, but you're also introducing a translation. And so to kind of decouple the two, uh, standard imaging kind of came aboard with uh, uh, with this cradle design, which is an isocentric rotation. So you, you put the Mimi in the Phantom, the Phantom will rotate in a pitch rolling yaw uh, isocentrically uh, about the Phantom. And so it helps uh, sort of uh, decouple the two uh, in a very clear cut way. Um, this Phantom itself uh, allows for, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, um, set positions. And the set positions are two and a half degrees from uh, uh, true normal or true zero. Uh, and it, it's both in pitch roll and yaw, and it's also in the positive and negative direction. So we can sort of cradle, we can rotate it forward and back, we can rotate it clockwise, counterclockwise, and then we could uh, roll it and pitch it uh, clockwise and counterclockwise, sorry, uh, roll it clockwise and counterclockwise as well. Uh, and so because these are, uh, the phantom itself is uh, very well machined and it has these sort of locking mechanisms at two and a half, um, you know, plus or minus two and a half uh, uh, settings, uh, the repeatability is, is known to be to within 0 0.1, 0 0.1 degrees. Uh, and so we sort of uh, acquired a number of these phantoms uh, and ultimately uh, ended up doing some of our testings. We took uh, a very uh, high precision level uh, and were able to sort of uh, match these. And so what we found, at least in the pitch uh, and roll, um, and we found exactly that, a very good reproducibility in terms of being able to quantify this. On our yaw, when we initially did the the, the assessment, it was a bit difficult because we were using a protractor. We later uh, then sort of uh, um, uh, realized that we can level the phantom in, in a more uh, sturdy um, uh, jig, and we were able to reproduce the same 2.5 plus or minus 0 0.5. And so we felt very comfortable that in both directions, um, that we had really good uh, physical kind of um, mechanical integrity of the two and a half degree uh, pitch. Uh, and so once we sort of uh, found that this was pretty accurate, we went ahead and, and sort of created a reference uh, CT data set that was going to use as, that was going to be used as the reference data set for registration on a daily basis. 
Uh, and so in order to really um, get very, uh, to minimize kind of the error in the registration uh, due, to, due to voxelization, um, we ended up having, you know, high resolution scans. And so we did, uh, in essence, a protocol that would be inclusive of the phantom and the smallest slice thickness that we can get. And so that for us was 0.6 by 0.6 by 1.25 millimeters. So this was sort of our reference CT that was used to do the fusions and the registration every day. Uh, we did ensure that it was level during the acquisition, uh, not only just outside of the table, but also at the imaging plane uh, to be able to really quantify and minimize any any sort of uh, intrinsic uh, offset due to couch sag or things of that nature or, or the tape or the phantom being leveled. So that really helped us get really re accurate and reproducible uh, readings. Um, after we sort of had this image set, we went in and then under uh, uh, various sort of platforms, uh, we sort of scanned the phantoms and uh, purposely pitched them uh, in one direction. So we would pitch them clockwise and counterclockwise. And so we were trying to assess kind of the re reproducibility or the repeat, sorry, the reproducibility of, of registration. And so although we knew mechanically, physically, we had displaced them 2.5 degrees you know, uh, based off our measurements, uh, our registration algorithms were giving us roughly 2.4, 2.3 per pitch, uh, whether we went clockwise or counterclockwise, roll, um, and, and uh, same thing uh, in yaw. And so uh, we did notice that obviously there's always some uncertainty that gets uh, that gets uh, uh, added in because of the voxelization and the registration issues between the two. But we found nonetheless, we were pretty consistent uh, in terms of the of sort of these values. And so uh, this kind of gave us a feel as to what, uh, what we would expect uh, when we did these um, independently. So these were sort of taking the phantom, pitching it only one direction, making the measure, the comium CT, and then doing the registration. Uh, and so this is really accounting for kind of the uh, the acquisition uh, or, or uncertainties associated to the discretization of the voxelization, as well as the registration, the uncertainty in the registration uh, um, software system itself. Uh, so we were able to see nonetheless good agreement between the two. Now, uh, it is something important to note that when you do combine these uh, in, 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 when you combine all the offsets together, uh, it's not necessarily the perfect 10, 12, 14 millimeters and then um, uh, 2.5, 2.5, 2.5, you end up getting some funkier numbers as it sort of does the registration. And, and part of that comes from the concept that uh, we're introducing the rotations at the isocenter, which is typically uh, towards, the, uh, um, towards the tip of the, um, of the couch, um, uh, where the patient typically, where the a target will be. And the majority of these have sort of mechanical displacements that are done at the base of the couch uh, for the various couch, couches that you have in each sort of vendor has a different uh, algorithm and, and, and different displacement. And so a, a two you know, degree uh, sort of pitch up here correlates to a, not only a pitch, but also a translation. And so it adds these factors in there. And so although the Phantom itself has known offsets, when you actually go in and repeat this, uh, you end up getting kind of different, uh, different baseline values that aren't the typical two and a half, two and a half uh, um, and uh, um, you know, 10, 12, and 14 millimeters. And so here's just an example. This is for our, for our proton therapy unit system. Uh, and you can see that the expected displacements, the uh, 10, 12, 14 are really 12.7, 26.8, and 15.7, which are those values. And our rotations are three, 1.9, and two and a half. Uh, and so this is what's kind of been consistent uh, based on what we do with our registration. So this is accounting uh, all these translations. Um, and so we've done this, and obviously we've, we've done it over and tracked it over some time period and kept uh, uh, and kept this as our baseline as we moved forward. Um, and so once we kind of had a feeling for it, we kind of developed our QA, QA workflow. And of course, every system has a different QA workflow uh, and your center is gonna be unique as well based on what we have. But in general, what we've sort of, you know, how we've adopted this, this, this workflow is to, you know, place the hexa check phantom on the tabletop. We use an indexing bar to secure it. Uh, we zero out all the rotations on the, uh, on the, on the, on the uh, Mimi hexa check setup. We align the Mimi to the offset uh, lasers. We apply the pitch roll and yaw after we've uh, we've aligned it. We then acquire comb MCT. Uh, we perform uh, a, an auto image registration. Uh, we then, uh, in essence, apply these translations and rotational corrections. We also verify them against our baselines to make sure they're within tolerance. Uh, we apply the shifts. Uh, and then once the phantom now is level, we then will acquire a KV-KV match. Uh, you can also acquire an MVMV match. And what we're really looking forward to there is to correlate the uh, the lateral uh, and an AP um, image set um, uh, using you know the, the bony rods that we've had before, and then 
ensuring that the center BB is uh, is well delineated and aligned. So that that's ensured that all the rotations have been corrected for, and that the uh, uh, that the Phantom now has been positioned into ISO Center. Uh, and so we would take KVKV match and then do an MVMV match if that's how we were uh, going to use this. And so that verifies the, sort of the ISO Center. And then after which we can then look at uh, uh, we can look at the how, how well aligned the lasers are relative to the center marks that we see. And so that that helps us verify the offsets of the lasers. So that's typically what we will do for, for, for our systems. When we first got this, and this was a study that we did back in my prior institution, and so we sort of found that as we were training people, we can see that some of our translations weren't necessarily uh, very consistent. Uh, there were the times that the, the rotation was uh, uh, was missed and we didn't really apply it. Um, but what we did find is that in general, the uh, there was some consistency uh, in our translations as well as our role. Uh, so we you know once the training was sort of initially done, we were able to get very consistent readings. Um, for our proton uh, kind of experience, we published this uh, last year, two years ago, um, and here you can sort of see the setup of our um, of our uh, uh, treatment table couch, where we have uh, uh, the hexacheck uh, with the Mimi um, for a comb beam, and we're also going to acquire a KVKV after. Uh, and so really, uh, we measured, uh, we had 202 data sets. This was over a span of uh, two years. Um, and we looked at kind of how much they flu uh, fluctuated uh, given you know relative to our baseline. Uh, and so what we were to find that at three sigma, um, you know we were consistently within 0.8 millimeters for our lateral uh, displacement, 0.6 millimeters for long and vertical. Uh, and our rotational sort of corrections uh, were within uh, 0.3 degrees uh, for uh, pitch and roll and 0.2 degrees for yaw. Uh, so you know we found very you know accurate and very sort of reproducible values uh, uh, with this phantom. Uh, to be able to do our daily QA uh, and, and, and sort of in our, 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 our long-term kind of trending showed the, that same result. Um, so um, with that, uh, I guess in, in summary, you know, we're coming up to some, our time. Um, you know, we were able to successfully implement a six-off uh, daily QA pro, uh, uh, program at MCI for all our six-off tabletops, uh, irrespective of sort of vendor and platform. Um, we, we found that really the construction of the HEXA check itself um, uh, was very consistent and, and has been robust over now ongoing to three years of use uh, with a uh, with number of team members. Um, we found that we were able to use this uh, uh, for multiple imaging platforms, um, whether it's been the, the Varian uh, OBI system, the RadExact uh, IBA Adapt Insight, uh, and we were able to, in, in, in all of those platforms, use uh, you know, good detection in terms of translations and, and, and rotations, and they were consistent. Um, and you know, overall, I mean, we've, our experience has been is that uh, in conjunction, the HexaCheck with the Mimi has proven to really be a, a robust tool for us and uh, really a useful IGRT uh, QA tool for primarily we've been using it for daily QA. Uh, we have initially done some testing with it when we commissioned some of these couches just to verify the, the consistency. Uh, so it also has a capability to be done uh, and to be useful from that perspective as well. Um, so with that, uh, I really uh, thank you for your time, and um, I'd like to mention, obviously, the work here presented has been a contribution from our team, and so we have a number of talented uh, uh, physicists here that work both on our photon and proton side and really contribute to a lot of the work that we have going on here. So uh, with that, I thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. And thank you, Dr. Gutierrez, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, again, just as a reminder, there's a small question box in the file menu uh, that you should find in your webinar uh, screen that you can enter questions. Um, I see one actually that is just coming in here. Uh, it is asking us to uh, please review again the inconsistent data when you initially started. Uh, that was Richard Goodman. I think maybe he's talking about the uh, yes. So I think here, uh, I think this is, so uh, I'm assuming it's probably focusing here. Yeah. So we initially, uh, so one of the key things is as we were applying the uh, the various corrections, um, uh, the pitches, uh, there are a number of times that uh, um, the therapist either A, sort of forgot to add uh, the specific correction. Uh, and so we had um, um, really no value for that. Um, uh, secondly, uh, if one of because if one of the angles was off, it would sort of contribute to the uh, uh, to measuring a second rotation or a second direction, and so that added to some of the fluctuations. Uh, and more importantly, I think um, at that time uh, we realized that the Phantom itself also has a base plate, um, and it also has these legs that help uh, level it. 
Uh, and so um, at times the therapist would accidentally move those base plates, uh, move the screws that would introduce sort of these or sort of unknown uh, preset offsets. Uh, and so that really um, um, added to the, the variation. Once that was detected, we were able to, uh, to really focus on and train the therapist as to how to, how to, uh, how to handle the, the Mimi. And that really led to actually very good reproducibility uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the pitch rolling yaw. So hopefully that answers the question. I, I think it does. Thank you. Uh, we did get another one in here asking, what tolerance do you use for the rotations for daily QA? Uh, so now we're using one degree uh, as our tolerance across the board. Um, part of it, as we kind of assess the data internally, um, like TG142, I think some of those values are, are based off of recommendations and, 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 and comes from experts. We initially thought about using just a one degree tolerance. And so part of our, re, part of our, our paper here with proton therapy and kind of our long-term QA or, or sorry, long-term evaluation of our daily QA was to move away from just standard one, you know, standard numbers and really make it based off machine performance. Uh, and so if you, if, you, if you look at the paper, um, uh, the one I'm sort of showing on here, our goal was really to say, hey, if we, if we start to set our tolerances based off of uh, sort of three sigma values, uh, which is more based off machine performance uh, and trending, um, uh, these would sort of be the values that we have. So I would argue that it'd be pretty safe to say 0.5 millimeters would be something that uh, we, could, we would be comfortable with setting as a tolerance. Uh, if needed to be. Now, that's just based off of machine performance. Whether that has a direct clinical impact uh, in terms of dosimetric differences, that's something else to be studied. But, uh, you know, based off our machine and our reproducibility, 0.5 is safe to say that we can accomplish that with our Leone couches uh, on our proton side. Uh, uh, and, and I think this is also going to be uh, uh, dependent on, uh, obviously, the couch, uh, the manufacturer, as well as the uh, um, capabilities of the registration of the algorithm uh, for image registration. But half a degree to one degree, or one degree for sure is safe, and half a degree I think is, is, is very possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions that have come in at this point. Uh, I really do appreciate the presentation again today. I think your the rationale that you gave for six degree of freedom daily QA was certainly very convincing and I appreciated the uh, workflow for the daily QA that you provided. I think that for all of our listeners is going to be very helpful. So uh, with that, I think we will close out our webinar and thank Dr. Gutierrez again for his time and presentation. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dan. And thanks, everyone, for uh, for your attention and as well as for the questions. I hope this uh, uh, this helps in, uh, in trying to adopt 6 o'clock QA. So uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you and have a good day.